God is good. And all the time, God is good. Our scripture this morning is from Psalm 91, as well as Luke 16, verses 19 through 31. You who live in the shadow of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, or the arrows that flies by day, or pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. And from Luke's Gospel, chapter 16, <clears throat> There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, who feasted sumptuously every day, and at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead... They will repent. He said to them, If they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even as someone rises from the dead. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The message is entitled, Blissfully Unaware. Dr. James Dobson tells about a friend of his, a specialist in obstetrics and also gynecology. And one day his friend telephones another specialist, uh, in gynecology. Um, then he asked him a favor. He said, you know, my wife's been having some abdominal problems and she is in really a lot of discomfort this afternoon. He said, I really don't want to treat my own wife. And so I wonder, would you see her for me? And so the other specialist invited the doctor to bring his wife in for an examination that very day. Well, when he did, he discovered she was five months pregnant. Her obstetrician husband was so busy with his own practice that he hadn't even noticed his wife finishing out her second trimester. He must have thought her weight gain had to do with, well, middle age, a normal part of life. Have you ever noticed some people are absolutely clueless about the very important things in life? Now, ladies, I know a great many of you uh, might say that about the special men in your lives, but guys, I know you might say the same thing about the special ladies in your lives. And the truth is, a lot of married couples spend a great deal of time wondering why their spouses uh, aren't more like the person they married. And I think this might be an explanation. You know, life does happen. Many of us can get so caught up with the commitments of life that we really get pressed for time. There simply aren't enough hours in a day to get everything done we want to get done. And things and people 
that we think are safe, a safe part of our lives, they tend to be overlooked, maybe even neglected, while we continue that frantic pace in just trying to get everything done. Around the holidays, it's especially nerve-wracking, and there's a lot of people who feel like they get lost in the shuffle. Now, according to Pastor Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church, one of the mega churches in our country, there is a little structure embedded in the brain stem that is called the reticular activating system. And the reticulator activating system acts as the brain's filter. And it allows us to filter all those sensory stimuli we receive and focus only on what's the most important to us. And so the reticular activating system allows us to fil filter out the hum of the fans, the projector, uh, that itchy sweater we're wearing, that flickering light, like that second one right there, um, so we can focus on the pastor's message. You know what I'm saying? Um, now, according to experts, there's three times, three types of... <coughs> information that are so important they always make it through our built-in filters. And the three types of information are things, one, unique, secondly, things we value, and third, the things we find threatening. For example, let's say you're in a business meeting, an important business meeting at work. You're really concentrating on what the boss is saying, and suddenly a car comes crashing through the window. Now, you would almost always notice that car crashing through the window because not only would it be unique, I mean, this doesn't happen every day, but it's also very threatening to you. Or let's just say you're working on a big home improvement project at the house and you're really engrossed in what you're doing and all of a sudden a little squeal comes from the baby's room. Well, you are ad automatically attuned to the voice of your baby and so you drop everything and you go and see what's going on with her. All of this is due, according to the experts, to this reticular activating system. Now Jesus told a parable about a rich man who was dressed in purple and in fine linen, who feasted sumptuously every day. Now, at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, who was covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Now, every day this rich guy would leave his home and he would go about his business. And every day this rich guy would return home and pass right by this poor beggar, Lazarus, um, do you think he ever paid any attention to Lazarus? Do you think, I mean, you know, even knew his name? Probably not. His reticular activating system filtered this poor guy out of the scene. He wasn't important to his life. Uh, not in this rich man's, you know, world. Every day the rich guy probably did his best to avoid contact, probably ten poor poor people just like Lazarus. And so if he was noticed at all, it was probably because the rich man was dis disgusted with him. <clears throat> the rich guy probably thought, you know, if poor people like Lazarus would just get a haircut and get a job, uh, things would start working out in their lives. Their problems would go away. They wouldn't be so poor. And so every day, this rich man probably did what he could to just not notice Lazarus at all. And what's interesting, though, is in this parable, we know Lazarus' name, but there's no mention of the rich guy's name. And so, guess who counts? If God had a reticulating or reticular activating system, Maybe that's why Jesus made the point of, of telling his disciples in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I'll give you rest. Now, to fully understand, I think, the full truth of what's in this parable, we need to see it in its full context. Jesus really was gunning for the Pharisees. Uh, Jesus told the, the parable, the rich man Lazarus, to show that the rich, the read Pharisee here, uh, shouldn't necessarily be equated with righteousness. And 
the Pharisees contended that their station in life was totally due to the fact that God approved of them, of their lifestyle, of their sense of self-worth, and because of their good works, God rewarded them in this life with the finer things that everybody wants. And so the rich man had everything he wanted or needed. Now, purple re referred to clothes dyed that color, and purple dye apparently is very expensive, and so it was a status symbol to wear purple. And the fine linen was worn as basically underclothes, and both were rather expensive. Now, every day he passes this poor beggar by, blissfully unaware of his presence. Now, in stark contrast, the poor man, who is a crippled beggar named Lazarus, he didn't have anything. One lives in luxury for himself, and the other lives in abject poverty, hungry, and poor health. Lazarus was righteous not because he's poor. He's righteous because he trusted in God. He depended on God. The rich man depended on himself, and thus, in the life that was yet to come, he was going to end up with nothing, because he left God out of his life equation. However, there would come a time when the rich man would be painfully aware of Lazarus. That's when, after he died. Pick it up, verse 23. In Hades, where he is being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger and cool my tongue from an agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things. Lazarus in like manner evil things, but now he is comforted here and you're in agony. Besides this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. Now the rich man couldn't believe his eyes, because there at Abraham's side was this poor beggar, the same beggar who had laid at his gate, this guy that was of no importance in the rich man's world. And so while the rich guy languishes in hell, Lazarus is in his glory. In life, the rich man had been blissfully unaware of Lazarus and everybody else just like him. And in hell, he still doesn't get it. He still thought that Lazarus and others like him ought to serve him as they had in life. He's absolutely clueless as to the way the kingdom of God does work. It was too late for the rich man. He'd had his chance. He'd blown it. His fate was sealed. He'd turned his head too many times in ignoring the beggar at his gate, and his heart was dull towards the Lord God. And so here in this place of torment, he still doesn't get it. And so he said, Then, Father, I beg you to send them to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, that they may not also come to this place of torment. And Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. And they should listen to him. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they'll listen, and they'll repent. And he said to them, If they don't, do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither, neither will they be convinced if someone rises from the dead. Now what's interesting is that in John chapter 11, Jesus did raise his, his friend Lazarus from the dead. And it's, it's kind of interesting, right about this time in his ministry, the Jews were trying to kill Lazarus because many Jews believed in Jesus because they knew Lazarus was dead, no longer was he dead. And so not only did they want to kill Jesus, they wanted to kill Lazarus as well. And so here's the outcome. So the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the council and said, What are we to do? This man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everybody will believe in him. And the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. Do you not understand that it is better to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed? He did not say this on his own. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was about to die for the nation. And not only 
destination only, but to gather into one the dispersed children of God. So from that day on, they planned to put him to death. Now, all of us, I think, can learn a valuable lesson from the Pharisees' utter failure. Sometimes the greatest part of our day, the most meaningful part of our day, is going to be the interruptions. It could be a child, it could be a spouse, it could be a total stranger that comes knocking on the door. Life is about relationships, and relationships are the only thing we're ever going to take from us or from this life into the one that is yet to come. And so we can't afford to be blissfully unaware of these people's presence. Now, have you ever been around a child that's starved for attention? I mean, they're on every playground. And some of them are actually a nuisance. I mean, but if they don't get the attention they crave, some of them can end up becoming, you know, lifelong problems in society. Now, of course, children in our society aren't the only ones that are starved for attention. Spouses, aging family members, shut-ins, people with disabilities. Today, people in nursing homes. Particularly during this pandemic, a lot of people are starving for attention. And it's not like we're being antisocial. It's just that our reticular activating system often filters them out as well because there's just other things that right now are occupying our minds. And we filter them out as well as other things just so we can keep going at the job we think is at hand. These people just aren't on our radar. And so tending to their needs would disrupt our carefully scripted and planned out existence. And so we don't even see them. And it happens all the time. It happens to you, it happens to me. We're in a hurry. We got places to go, people to meet. We got goals to accomplish. And just like that gynecologist with a pregnant wife, sometimes we don't see what's right in front of our eyes. And just like the Pharisees, we can't afford to be blissfully unaware of the special people that God has placed in our lives. And so I want to issue a challenge for the coming week. And we need to start off with something really easy. Try to find a way to break the cycle of being blissfully unaware of the special people that are in our lives. And so take just five minutes every day to just engage in some polite conversation or get down on the rug and play with the children or the grandchildren or, or if your parents, your grandparents, your aunts or uncles are still with us, why not make a special effort to be a part of their day? Now, <clears throat> the possibilities actually are endless. And I would classify this as basically a random act of kindness. But it goes more than being a random act of kindness. It actually goes to being a part, a building foundational part of our lives. Lassoing the moon, like Jimmy Stewart in the movie It's a Great Life, uh, may not be an option for any one of us, but a phone call, a good word, some thoughts, some prayers, you know, of care can go a long way. And they also add up. Anything Jesus would do for a friend or a family member or a stranger, you know, that's something we should do as well. Amen? Let us pray. Father God, we need to nip this reticular activating system that we've all got in the bud. And sometimes, Lord, we need to take five, and recognize there's more important things in life than just what we're doing at the moment. And so remind us, Lord, that not only are we your workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, but we're also, Lord, in this together with everyone else. And remind us, Lord, that it's all about you working in us. We pray it all in Christ's holy name. Amen.